What I'm going to try to do today is address some of the heresy that Brother Ken Hovind is teaching about a post-tribulation rapture. So he's, he's very, very messed up with his doctrine here. I'm going to try to address some of it. And there's just so much that he puts out here that it's false. And I'll try to address that. I'm going to listen to a little clip here. And then I'll try to listen to, the, to a decent portion here. And then try to address some of the things he says. Second Thessalonians, Paul said, Beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, quite obviously the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us. Apparently somebody wrote a letter and signed Paul's name and he didn't write it. As that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is the rapture. The day of the Lord is a thousand year period. Don't confuse the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Get a King James Bible. The other Bible perversions mess those up. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The day we're gathered together, until, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. We're here when Antichrist is revealed. When he sets up his image in the temple, even the Jews are going to say, oh, no, this is not the guy. And he's going to, and we're going to see that. The Christians are going to see that. Now, what he does here, to me, it's pretty obvious of what the Bible's talking about here. Verse 1, he is correct, obviously, that our gathering together onto him is referring to the rapture. There's no doubt about that. But what he does when he says, do not confuse the day of Christ with the day of the Lord. We'll look later on where he absolutely confuses the two because he uses the verse in Matthew chapter 24, where the Bible talks about the sun and the moon going dark and before Christ comes, and that is the day of the Lord. Now, he says that's the rapture, and he tries to say here that the rapture and the day of the Lord are two distinct events, and yet he contradicts himself by saying that. Now, the day of the Lord is also known as the day of Christ. And I know that may upset a lot of people because for years, that's what people teach. The day of Christ is the rapture, but it's not that way. The definition within the context is obvious that the day of Christ cannot be the rapture because somebody wrote a letter or however they, they heard this, that the day of Christ was at hand. Well, if, if someone would write a letter to me or someone would say something to me that the rapture was soon going to happen, that would not make me shaken in mind. It would not trouble me in my spirit to know that. Matter of fact, I believe we're getting very close to the rapture, and I'm not troubled by that at all. What I am troubled by would be what exactly he is doing by teaching that people are going to go through this time that God refers to as Daniel's 70th week, Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation in the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. This is exactly what Paul warned against. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that's the rapture, I beseech you by the rapture that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, if the day of Christ is the rapture, that would make no sense because he's beseeching them by the rapture not to be troubled by the rapture, if that's the correct interpretation. And obviously, if you have half a brain and one eye, as he likes to say, you would understand that that can't possibly be the rapture for the day of Christ. And obviously, with Matthew, where he says about it's the rapture, where the sun and the moon go dark, that is talking about the day of the Lord. And we'll look at that in a minute. But he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now, what day? The day of Christ. And that would be the day of the Lord. That day cannot happen except there come a falling away first. Now, here, here again, we have a real problem with understanding the, the meaning of certain words. And where it says about a falling away first, that word is apostasia. Now, we have 
what are called transliterated words, and that's exactly what apostasia was transliterated. And when or we come up with the word apostasy, which means to, to fall into error doctrinally. Now, here it says, except there come a falling away first. Now, this word is used twice in the entire Bible, apostasia. And the other time it's used, it's used in the book of Acts, where Paul was accused of falling away from Moses, teaching them to depart, the Bible says, depart from Moses, apostasia from Moses. And they were saying that he was telling them to depart from the law that Moses had written. And here, this it's a departure, departing, leaving. And except there come a falling away first, the two things that he has underlined here is very important because our gathering together onto him is the departure. It is the falling away. There has to be that departure of the Christians before the man of sin can be revealed, the son of perdition. And, of course, the rest of that chapter in Second Thessalonians goes on to talk about this son of perdition who declares himself to be God, sets in the temple, declares himself to be God, which is the midpoint of the tribulation period, or Daniel's 70th week, if you prefer that. When he does this, the only thing that's keeping him from showing up now as the man of sin is because Christians are still here. There has to be a falling away first, a departure of believers. So I believe he's in error here, but we'll go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and move this up a little bit and we'll start listening right around here. These, These things, things have, have I spoken unto you, you that, that in me you might have peace. In, in the, the world, world ye shall have, have tribulation, tribulation. but be, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. world. So tribulation is what the world does to us. Jesus said we're going to have it. He said we're not appointed unto wrath. He's going to keep us from falling. The only wise God, our Savior. So the time of tribulation, we're here for the whole thing. I used now, that's, that's really taking things to the extreme where he just concludes this because, hey, Christians will always suffer tribulation, will always suffer persecution. Now, if you live in America, like I grew up in the United States of America, very little persecution do we suffer here. Some people may lose jobs over their belief in Christ. Some people may suffer like he did by going to jail where he was singled out because of his outspokenness for the Lord. And that happens, and that's expected to happen. That's not a shocker. But we are not, you know, we're not going to go into this time of tribulation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. He even has that here. Now, there's some amazing conclusions he comes to and his timeline is so far out of skew, but we'll continue listening here. I used to believe we're raptured out before. No, I'm sorry. Here for the whole thing. Antichrist breaks the treaty in the middle. Let me go to 2199. Okay. He shall confirm the covenant for one week. We talked about that in a couple of nights ago. So here's Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. They asked him the question in the red box in all three passages. When are you coming? What's the sign? When are you coming? What's the sign? For the next 19 verses or 17 verses, he says, talks about all the tribulation. In the middle of each one of them is the abomination of desolation. You can look at it for yourself. At the end, he says down here, he answers their question. Matthew 24, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of time. Uh, when you see the abomination of desolation set up, we're going to see it. Uh, let's see. Don't go back to the housetop. Let's see. It's going to be great tribulation. All right. Here, okay, 42 months, I want to get up to, okay. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. For there Now, right there, that's a quick thing he goes over, but unless those days be shortened, no flesh shall be saved. Now, if you look at his timeline, I'm not going to play it here, but his timeline goes way beyond the end of the Great Tribulation. Now, Jesus is the one that says, unless the, that time be shortened, and that means it's cut off at the end of the seven years. Now, I know there's a, a time period Daniel talks about, but it's basically like a cleanup time after the Battle of Armageddon takes place. It extends beyond it so many days. But there's 
no more war after that point. Christ has destroyed the nations that come against him at Armageddon. So he is, he is in denial when he says that, and he quickly glosses over it. Christ said, unless those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved alive. And obviously, when he returns, there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. Then there's going to be the gathering of the nations where Christ is going to judge the nations. And then those ones that survived, that helped Israel, they will go in to the millennial reign of Christ. So he's an error there as well. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that when he says about the disciples questioning about what should be the sign of thy coming, they did not ask, when is the rapture going to happen? They had no concept of a rapture. I just want to address that really quick because there's so much that people teach that is absolute error. The book of Acts, when Christ was getting ready to ascend back up to heaven, Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem till they'd be endued with power from on high. And let's find it here quick. Yeah. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Notice their question was not, Lord, when are you coming for us at the rapture? They had no understanding of that. The Apostle Paul had that revealed to him. The, the rapture was a mystery. The church was a mystery. And the Jews were looking for the kingdom. And when they asked Jesus when he was going to come, what should be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? They were looking forward to a time when Messiah would come and set up his kingdom, just like he's going to do at the end of the great tribulation. He is going to destroy the nations of this world. He's going to take back all the kingdoms of this world, and he's going to sit as king over the whole world. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, and Israel is going to be the head of the nations again. That was the question. They had no concept about a rapture. And if you get into Acts chapter number two, I really don't want to go this route, but we will anyway. Acts chapter number two, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were those that mocked. But what did Peter say? Peter said, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out of the, in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, is this what was happening at that time? No. There, there was not the sun and the moon being darkened that is prophesied in the book of Joel. That was before the day of the Lord comes. Now, in a sense, now God knows everything that's going to happen, but in a sense, Jesus would have came if Israel would have received him as their Messiah. And in a sense, the sun and the moon already had been darkened at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross for three hours, it was pitch black. It was dark. And Peter witnessed that along with everyone else. And Peter thought that this was what took place. But that is yet future. There is coming a time in the future when the sun and the moon and the stars of heaven are going to go dark. And that precedes what the Bible calls the day of the Lord. So these 
guys had no concept. And I, I've done other videos explaining the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And if you need to, you ought to watch that. And I go into detail and explain about what Peter and the other apostles to the circumcision, what they believed in comparison to what the apostle Paul, what he taught and what he believed, and the, the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And there is a huge difference. There shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and show great signs and wonders and deceive the very elect. And he goes here, verse number, here we go, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Hold it. They asked him, when are you coming, and what's the sign? One minute. He said, I'm coming after the tribulation when the sun and the moon go dark. There's the sign. The sun and the moon go dark. That comes at the end. Revelation 6, 12 is when the sun and the moon go dark. We're here for the first five seals of Revelation chapter 6. We're not here when the wrath falls, but we are here for the tribulation. Down here in every passage. Did you say time for me? Okay. Uh, let's see, right here. First, Mrs. Matthew, immediately after the tribulation shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in power with, with, in heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and shall gather together his elect. That's the rapture. When does it happen? After the tribulation, when the sun and the moon go dark. In the Mark, uh, Mark chapter 13 passage, Immediately after the tribulation shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars from heaven fall. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he shall send his angels and gather together his elect. That's the rapture. And it happens after the tribulation when the sun and the moon go dark. Mentioned 12 times the sun and the moon going dark. Then shall they see him coming in the clouds with the sound of a great trumpet in Matthew. This is obviously the rapture. And then he goes on, talks about other stuff and the parable of the uh, fig tree and all that stuff. So my position had to change. I very. Uh, he says this is obviously the rapture. No, it's obviously what many Christians refer to as the second coming. It's obviously the time that Jesus said that he would come and restore Israel again as a nation. And it's a time where Israel is going to be saved. And in part one that I made, I, I touched several of these things, but it's just amazing that he's gotten so messed up in his doctrine where he actually thinks that Matthew 24, the sun, the moon, and the stars being darkened is the rapture. And it's obviously the day of the Lord. And I'll just go here a little bit and take a look at what the day of the Lord is. Now, he's, he says in the videos about the day of the Lord is a thousand year time period. And it's a time of blessing and a time of cursing. Well, the Bible defines the day of the Lord. And here in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor, nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he shall make even a speedy riddance of them that dwell in the land. Now this is a day, one day, and it's a day that is defined here. It's not a day of blessing. It is a day of judgment. The book of Amos, Amos chapter number 5 and verse number 18. The Bible says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And um, as a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? 
So it's not a day of blessing. It's a day of judgment. Isaiah chapter number 2. This is the first mention of the day of the Lord. And down at verse number 12. It says, For the day of the Lord of hosts is, shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And as you read down through here, we get down to verse 19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for the fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Now this is the day of the Lord. Now Ken Hovind tells us that we've got to make a distinction between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Well, the, the day of Christ that is talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 is the day of the Lord, because that's when the sun and the moon goes dark, and then he comes in judgment against this world. And we are out of here. Paul said, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together onto him. That's the rapture. We're raptured out of here before that day ever takes place. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, the rapture, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So here we see, just like in Revelation, where the people go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake, to shake terribly the earth. Now, that is exactly what Revelation chapter number 6 is talking about. Now, again, this is, this is where Kent says that the sixth seal, when that's broken, that there's a great earthquake, and the sun become black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon become as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, and she's shaken in a mighty wind. And that, he says, is the rapture. Well, that's the day of the Lord. It's not the rapture. And the disciples that asked Jesus, what's the sign of thy coming? They didn't say, what is, when are you coming in the rapture? They had no understanding of that. Notice that in the heaven, the part as a scroll and it's rolled together, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that setteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Well, that, day, that great day of wrath is the day of the Lord. And his wrath is going to come upon these people. Now, he says, Ken Hovind says that this is the rapture. And then beyond that, it gets into the wrath. Now, I would like to just take a little time here and look, because this, this deal with the sun and the moon being darkened, it's a big issue. And it consistently points to a time that is known as the Battle of Armageddon. There's so much here, so many different ways to go. I could make a video that would last for several hours if I would cover everything here. But let me just point out several things here. Number one, this here with the sixth seal that's broken... It leads up to the very day of the Lord. Now I'm going to look at Revelation chapter number 16. Revelation 16. And let's look about verse 18. Okay, now here are the seventh. Okay, let's, let's go back here. Two, verse number 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the sixth angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, 
to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now that judgment's going to take one hour. That's it. One hour. God's going to destroy that great city Babylon. And notice, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And this all is leading up to Armageddon. When the sun and the moon and the stars go dark and there's a great earthquake. That's another thing that's, that is thrown in there, along with the sun and the moon being darkened, is a great earthquake. Just like when Jesus was on the cross, there was a great earthquake. The sun and the moon was darkened. There was a great earthquake. And the graves were opened, a lot of graves opened in Jerusalem. But again, here we see the same type of signs taking place here at the end as what took place when Christ died on the cross. Now, it all leads up to Armageddon. Now, let's just go back to, let's go back to chapter number 14. And toward the end of the chapter. Let's start at verse 15. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Notice it's the harvest of the earth. This is the Jews being gathered together. As I talked about in part one, if you haven't seen that, watch part one and explain to you what the gathering of the elect is in Matthew 24. It's dealing with the nation of Israel. And I'll use Old Testament verses there to show exactly what it's talking about. So many people get confused because they do not refer to the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So make sure when you're studying the Bible and you see things in the Bible Make sure you're not just making things up, but go back to the Old Testament. See the terminology used in the Old Testament. Verse 16, He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp, in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now this, again, is a reference to the battle of Armageddon. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepresses even onto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal it all leads up to the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, again, leads up to the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 14 leads up to the battle of Armageddon. And of course, lastly, would be Revelation 19 that leads up to this point. So the, the book of Revelation is obviously, obviously not a linear book. Things you read don't happen in succession. What well, we just read about Babylon coming up in remembrance of God and God was going to destroy it, that's later recorded. And it's the way Revelation is written, you cannot take it as being linear. It overlays itself with a scroll. And I, I think... Ironside had the best way of explaining it. When you unroll a scroll, you are revealing two sides of that scroll, the back and the front. And it's easy to tell when God brings the same event, the Battle of Armageddon, over and over and over again. And here's another time where we see here at the end, Verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and them that sat on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. This is... 
the Battle of Armageddon. Now, what takes place here, the birds that are gathered together, there's so much, and again, I hope this has some continuity to it, but there's so much going on if, with Matthew 24. Let's see if I can find that quick. Matthew 24 and verse 28 says this, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And then it says about the sun and the moon being darkened. But the eagles are gathered together first, where the carcass is. Well, there's these carcasses that are going to be there. They're going to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of horses, and so on that are there at this battle. And some say, well, oh, we're raptured up where the eagles are gathered together. No, carcasses don't rise up into the air. Carcasses lie dead on the ground. And that's where the eagles are going to be gathered, along with other birds. And when we go to the book of Luke, and some people want to teach this as being the rapture, where there's two women grinding together, one taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one taken and the other left. And some people say, well, this is the rapture. Well, notice what the disciples asked Jesus. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? Where are these people taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. And there are some that say, Well, the, where the body is taken, well, that's taken up in the rapture, and that's where the eagles are going to be gathered together. Well, have you seen in Matthew where the carcass is, there will the eagles be also. These bodies are gathered together, just like the armies of this world are gathered together at Armageddon. And that's where the eagles are going to be gathered. They're gathered to this great sacrifice that God has for these birds. Notice here, Isaiah 34. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood and is made fat with fatness and the, with the blood of lambs and goats and the fatted kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Now, this is talking about that time. Notice here, when all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their host shall fall down. So it's the sun and the moon and the stars darkened. And God is going to bring judgment. And he has a sacrifice. And who's coming to that sacrifice? A bunch of birds are coming to that sacrifice. And here again, like Revelation 14 talked about the gathering together of the grapes. And here it is again. We have Jesus, who, and it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Then the question is asked, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? And Jesus says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And of course, the year of his redeemed is talking about Israel. And the vengeance is taken because of those that were against his people. Notice here, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together onto the supper of the great God. And again, that's the birds all being gathered together. This is Armageddon. This is the very end when the sun and the moon and the stars go dark and Jesus is coming. And you can see how Everything just lines right up, like Isaiah. We looked at with Isaiah how they flee into the rocks for the fear of the Lord. And then Revelation 6 talks about how they flee into the, the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, hiding from the great day of his wrath. That's the day of the Lord. 
Now, this is what Ken Hovind wants you to believe is the rapture. Now, this is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is one day. The Bible defines it as a day of darkness and wrath and all bad things. It doesn't say the day of the Lord is a day of blessing. But take the Bible for what it says. Zephaniah says, this is, I believe, chapter 3, yes, chapter 3, verse number 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. You can't see anything but wrath coming on the day of the Lord. He's going to judge the nations. He's also going to save Israel. All of Israel is going to be saved. Romans chapter number 11. And also in Zechariah speaks of that as well. But that day when it's a day of darkness and the sun and the moon go dark, it's a day where God is going to judge the nations. Joel chapter number 3. Notice that I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is Armageddon. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And by the way, that's something that they're talking about now. Our president of the United States, Joe Biden, is talking about parting Israel. He took the flag, the Jewish flag, off of the beast, the car that they drive the president in, took that off when they went into East Jerusalem. Why? Well, because he wants to represent the Palestinian people and, and take and divide Jerusalem. And it's going to happen. And God's going to bring judgment because of that. Now, Joel, let me just go back. I'll go back to Joel chapter 2. And notice here, it says about the day of the Lord cometh. It's nigh at hand. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even in the years of many generations. And there's a fire that goes before them, and their appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Well, that's interesting because that's Revelation 19 when we come back on white horses. And that's the army that's coming. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to lead that army. And if you take time and read down through this, this leaves no doubt when this is. Verse 10 says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Now, this, with all the scripture we've looked at so far, this pops up over and over and over. Who can abide it? You know, who's going to stand before that, the wrath of the Lamb? Nobody. And this is, the day of the Lord is the day of Christ, which is a day of wrath, it's a day where God brings judgment against this world that's been against him, and he's bringing back his people. Revelation 19, those on white horses, that'll be us that are saved, have been raptured out seven years prior to this. We're coming again. And again, the sign, the sun and the moon being darkened, is not for the rapture, because we're coming back with him on horses, and we're coming back to destroy the armies that are coming against Christ. Joel chapter number three. If you just read the book of Joel, you get a good idea about the sign here. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Again, that's the sign Jesus talked about when, when he was asked, what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? The end of the age. It's going to be when Jesus sets the kingdom up for Israel. But let's look right here. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, and their wickedness, or for their wickedness, is great. And right away, Revelation 14 pops into mind that we just read a while back. 
Uh, the grapes are gathered together. The sickle's put in, the grapes are gathered, and they're put into that great press. And that's right before the Battle of Armageddon. And this, this is exactly what it's talking about, where the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. And then, notice verse 16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Again, sun and the moon dark, the earth shaking over and over and over. Those three signs, sun and the moon being darkened and the earth shaking. And that when that takes place, the, the heavens also will shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And there's going to be great judgment that comes upon these people, upon the heathen. And the day of the Lord is also known as the time of the heathen. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. So the mighty ones are us coming down on horses to destroy these people. Christ is going to destroy the people at Armageddon, and we're going to do mop-up work. But there is no, now here again, what we looked at before about thrusting in that sickle. He's going to reap the earth, which is Israel being gathered together. And then he's going to have another angel thrust in, and he's going to gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. This is Armageddon. That's what Matthew 24, when it talks about the sun and the moon being darkened, that's exactly what it's talking about. It's not the rapture. Rapture happens seven years prior to that event. And there's so much Brother Hovind has wrong with what he teaches about the rapture. And I just, let me just go back, look one, one time here at 2 Thessalonians. Because this, I believe, is where a lot of error starts and it progresses from here. But when you when you realize, and I know, hey, I'm a I'm a proponent of the King James Bible. I don't read any other Bible. I know that some of the other translations, the and they're they're taken from the wrong text, number one. And when it says about the day of the Lord for verse two, instead of the day of Christ. The thing, the thing that's wrong, and I should say the day of Christ, because that's what the, the text says. It's not the day of the Lord, as this says, but the, the thing of it is, it is the word Christ, but it refers to the day of the Lord. Because the day of the Lord is a time of judgment. And if it's not, again, if I'm going to read this as Kent Hovind would want you to take this, that the day of Christ is the rapture. And you explain to me how it makes any sense if that's truly what it means. And I'm going to also, for verse number one, where it talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, I'm going to just paraphrase it and we'll just call that the rapture. And we'll call the day of Christ the rapture. And that day shall not come, I'll put for the rapture shall not come, and we'll just read it from there. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the rapture is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the rapture shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now how does that make any sense? It doesn't does not make any sense at all. But if you take it for what it means, and here, here again, here's something else that people do. They define things and then progress from there. That's what we're seeing in our society now with the woke people the redefining things. I mean, you have a, a lady who is sitting now in the Supreme Court. She couldn't define what a woman is, but... When the president stands up and says this is the first black woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court, she doesn't bang her head against the wall and say, what are you talking about, a black woman? She understands. It, it's 
it's very, I think, disingenuous on their part. And I believe a lot of times Bible teachers like to set things up and position things so then they can argue from that point. But you cannot say that the day of Christ is the rapture because it does not make any sense. No Christian who's walking with the Lord and looking for his return at the rapture is going to be shaken in mind or troubled by the thought that Jesus is coming at the rapture. Now, I don't believe the rapture is imminent. I don't believe it can happen at any moment. I believe like the apostle Paul, when he said about, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, Paul believed that he could be raptured in his day. Now, did he believe he could be raptured at any moment? No, I don't think so. I think he understood the Jewish festivals and he understood that Jesus was coming at the rapture at the Feast of Trumpets. So every year, I believe Paul thought this could be the year. That's what I believe. And I believe that's easily proven in the Bible. I have videos about that too. But anyway, this cannot be, the that, that day of Christ cannot be the rapture. Doesn't fit. Makes no sense at all. And I know good men believe that, but it does not make any sense. So that's about all I have for for this part, there's so much other stuff, though, and maybe I'll come back and this video may be a little too long, and maybe I'll come back and try to break it down a little better, because there's the gatherings spoken of in, in Matthew 24. There's a bunch of different gatherings. One is the gathering of the elect, which is Israel. One is the gathering of the birds, the fowl of the air, for that time of sacrifice that God has in that day that we know best as Armageddon, and they're going to eat the bodies of men and animals at that place. Where the body is, there will the eagles also be gathered. Where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. And the birds are going to be filled with the great sacrifice. There's another place in Ezekiel talks about that. I believe it's Ezekiel 39. If I can look it up out of my Bible here, just read it to you real quick. Ezekiel 39. Let me just pop it up here. That's what we'll do. Let's go back to Ezekiel 39. And this sacrifice. It says, and thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. So there you have it. That's, this is the day of the Lord. This is the battle of Armageddon. This is where, all, you know, it says, ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till you be full and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. And then notice what happens. He says, and I will set my glory among the heathen. And all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, my hand that I have laid upon them. Another question I would have for Brother Hoven is, if that sign of the appearing of Christ in heaven is the rapture, when the sun, the moon, and stars go dark, Jesus comes, rapture happens according to him, why is it then the people on the earth would not recognize Christ as who he truly is? There's no doubt. There's going to be no question who he is when he comes. Because in Revelation 6, they know who it is that's coming. They know the wrath of the Lamb has come. They know they're, they're damned at that point. If there was any hope for them at all at that point, they would turn to Christ. But their time is over. It is a time of wrath, a time of judgment. So the day of Christ in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 truly equates to the day of the Lord. And it is a time when the gathering together of the bodies and the carcasses is not the rapture. 
but it is a judgment from Almighty God against the heathen.